Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this morning's service. And I want to give a special welcome uh, to um, friends and family of Charlotte uh, and to say how uh, glad we are that you're here with her uh, to share this uh, happy occasion for her and for us, uh, her church family as well. So, so welcome uh, to you. Uh, just a couple of uh, practical things. After the service, we'll serve tea and coffee just behind the doors at the back uh, there, so please do stay uh, if you are able to. Um, let's use all available space so you can bring tea and coffee back in here um, to, to use all, all available uh, space, um, so, so do stay for that if you can. Uh, and, and let's just be sensitive um, towards each other in terms of uh, social contact and uh, a personal space Different people will have different uh, tolerance levels for, for that, so um, please just be uh, respectful towards each other. Now, life has its ups and its downs, doesn't it? But one great thing about being a Christian is that in Jesus and what he gives us, we have a reason for joy and peace and hope that remains even when our circumstances are the very worst they could be and give us no reason for joy and peace and hope. And we're going to recognize that uh, and celebrate that that's true in our first hymn this morning. So as the music begins, uh, let's stand together and sing when peace like a river attends all my way. And the chorus of each verse says, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's stand to sing as the music begins. Let this color shine. 
And let's uh, talk now to God as we pray. Let's pray. Thank you, our Father in heaven, for the life and breath that you have given us today and for every good thing that you have given us to enjoy in our lives. But thank you most of all for your gift to the world of your Son, Jesus, and the eternal life that we receive through faith in him. We thank you that, unlike anything else, our relationship with you through Jesus is a solid joy and a lasting treasure. We praise you for all that you were willing and able to do to achieve this for us. For Jesus' amazing life of perfection on this earth. For his willingness to even die instead of us. For his defeat of even death as he rose back to life. We come to you today as those deserving of the wages of sin, which is death. We come as those unable to produce or earn eternal life for ourselves. We each need it as a free, undeserved gift from you. And so we praise you that being the generous God you are, you offer and give it freely to all who ask. This morning especially, we we want to thank you for causing Charlotte to see her need of Jesus and his free gift over the past months and years as you have worked in her life. We praise you for enabling her to turn away from living life without Jesus and now to trust and follow him. We recognize that such a change can only be brought about by you. And so we give you all the glory and praise for it this morning. We pray that today's baptism will be a source of great joy and encouragement to Charlotte. We ask that you will enable her to follow Jesus from this day forward all the days of her life. We pray that you'll enable her to put him first and at the centre of her life. To serve him with all the gifts that you have given her. To make him known to all people who she meets. Thank you that you have promised never to leave her. To give her sufficient strength for every situation she faces. To supply her every need and to continue the good work begun in her all the way to completion in the new creation when Jesus returns. We also want to thank you this morning for Charlotte's family and friends who are here today and and those who are not able to be here today. We thank you for all all who have loved her, supported her, and influenced her for good in any way. We thank you for giving Charlotte the gift of these people in her life. And we ask that where you have not done so already, that you will work in and change their lives as well, just like you have Charlotte's. Help us today, we pray, in all that we do in this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to read from the Bible. Uh, The Bible is the way God speaks to us. And we're going to read from a book of the Bible that's the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. And Belinda Drummond's going to come and read that to us. Belinda Drummond. So Revelation 1, verses 1 to 6. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. 
He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who who is to come and from the seven spirits who were before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of kings on earth. To him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to spend now a few minutes thinking about um, the last uh, couple of sentences that we read uh, there. Uh, these words in verses 5 and 6, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, let me begin by asking you this question. When you think of Christianity, what comes into your mind? When you think of Christianity, what comes into your mind? Revelation 1 verses 5 to 6 point us to three of the most important things that Christianity is about. And I wonder if they are what came to your mind just now. Three things this morning. Number one, what is Christianity about? Number one, Revelation 1, 5 to 6 says to us, Christianity is about Love from God. Love from God. I wonder, is one of the things that came into your mind just now that Christianity is about rules? Do you think it is about doing all the things you are told that you need to do? Now, the Bible does contain rules and commands. Those rules and commands show us how life works best. And they're given to us by God because the God who made us does not want us to be as foolish as someone who buys a flat pack wardrobe from Ikea but instead of following the maker's instructions, tries to put the pieces together in a completely different order and completely different configuration from which they're designed. This is what we are like if we ignore our maker's instructions and think that we know best about how life should work. But actually, even having said all of that, the biggest theme in the Bible is not what we are to do, but rather what God has done. And the first thing that Revelation 1 verse 5 tells us that God has done and indeed is doing is Love us. The beginning of verse 5 tells us that John is speaking here about Jesus Christ. The beginning of verse 5, he talks about Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. 
Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is God. He is God the Son. And around 2,000 years ago, he became human, being born as a baby and then growing up as a man. And it is concerning him then that John then says in verse 5, to him, Jesus Christ, God the Son, to him who loves us. To him who loves us. God loves us. Does that surprise you? Do you realize that God is not distant and disinterested. He loves, he cares about the world and people that he has made. How much does he love us? Does he love us just with nice words, nice feelings? No. He loves us to the extent of securing our freedom by giving his very life. Look at verse 5 again. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, by dying. Now surely the, the Bible is right When it says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. I think we see um, frequently that, that all kinds of people believe that that's true. When someone risks or even gives their own life to save others, Maybe by taking on an armed terrorist or rescuing a drowning person, they rightly make the headlines. Well, this verse is telling us that that kind of self-sacrifice is what God has done in the greatest possible way for us. As Jesus died, as Jesus shed his blood by being crucified for our freedom. Which we'll see more about what that means in a minute. So don't, don't write off the Christian message as just a bunch of rules telling you what to do. Don't do that, not only because the rules that do exist are for your good, but more so don't do that because first and foremost, the Christian message is about what God has done for you. And what God has done is no less than love you so much that he died in order, to, in order to, to secure your freedom. That is a message worth listening to. So what is Christianity about? Number one, it's about love from God. Secondly, and following on from that, what is Christianity about? It's about freedom from Sin. I wonder again, is is one of the things that came into your mind at the start of this message when I asked that question, that Christianity is about restriction and loss of freedom. Well, actually, did you notice that verse 5 tells us that Jesus has secured freedom For us. And therefore, it is Christians, it is those who know and follow Jesus who are actually the free ones. To him who loves us 
and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Let me ask you, when is a fish free? Is a fish free when it can go anywhere it wants to without any limits? Or is it free when it stays in the water? The fish is free when it is in the place for which it is designed. A fish is free when it is in the place for which it is designed. Outside of that, it is not free. Rather, it's, it's dead. And you know, something similar to that is true of us people. You see, we're designed by God to know God and to live our lives for a purpose that's greater than any other purpose. The purpose of serving God in this world. But left to ourselves, there's a power within us called sin that actually stops us, restricts us from doing that. Because it deceitfully tells us that to be free is to do whatever I want. But in doing that, it it offers freedom, but actually it robs us of freedom. Because like fish out of water, we are not free to be what we are designed to be. And left to ourselves, like fish out of water, by doing that, we are actually dead. The Bible says to us, for the wages of sin is death. What sin pays is death. To not have a relationship with God is to be already spiritually dead. And ahead of us, left to ourselves, lies only the penalty we deserve for rejecting God our maker, which is the experience of everlasting death, the everlasting death of his judgments. But Revelation 1, 5 to 6, is telling us the wonderful good news That Jesus can set us free from all of that. And that he does so for all who depend on him as saviour. And that's why Romans 6 verse 23 continues. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God is rescue, freedom. From all of that death and experience of eternal, everlasting life. Now, Jesus is the one who can set us free from death because he died by his blood, as the verse says. Because he died instead of all who trust and follow him. He is the one who can set us free. He received the eternal death of God's judgment our sin deserves instead of us when he died on the cross. He paid the penalty so instead we can receive the good gift of freedom from the ruling power of sin in our lives and the freedom to, yes, Fulfill that big purpose for which we are designed, living our lives for God. That big purpose is mentioned in verse 6. It's what verse 6 is talking about when it says that uh, Jesus, setting us free, made us a kingdom, priests to his God 
and Father. That's saying to us that that, that we get to represent God on earth, especially by showing his love and sharing his message of freedom with all people. And you know, there is no purpose to live for that is greater than that. I don't know what you would say you are living for. What's your purpose in life? There is no purpose greater or bigger than this. Because unlike every other purpose, the consequences of this purpose are literally everlasting. They are not rendered ultimately pointless by death and by the end of the world. What is more, because Jesus also rose again from the dead back to life, even physical death, the death of our bodies, will be overcome for those who have a relationship with him, as our bodies will rise one day so that we can live in a perfected world. I wonder, how would you feel if all your thoughts from the last week, let's say, suddenly appeared on the screen behind me for everyone to see? If, like me, you would definitely not want that to happen, then you are admitting that you do things, that you think things that are not right, things that are wrong. You are admitting that you sin, to use the Bible's words. You are admitting that that power that I referred to is within you. And understand that that power of sin within you will tell you that freedom is about doing whatever you feel you might want to. And therefore it will tell you to write off Christianity as restrictive and freedom taking. But don't believe it. Rather see that it is this power of sin that restricts you. Because it keeps you from the most important and significant thing. It keeps you from knowing God. From enjoying a relationship with him. And from living your life for that biggest of all purposes, serving him in the world. It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, the one who you follow as a Christian, who can set you free. What is Christianity about? It's about love from God. It's about what God has done first and foremost. It's about freedom, freedom, freedom from sin and its consequence, death. Thirdly, what is Christianity about? It's about glory to God. It's about glory to God. Let me ask you to cast your mind back again to the question at the start of this message is one of the things that came into your mind at the start of this message that Christianity is for good people. Christianity is for people who are good, or at least people who think they are good. Is that what Charlotte is saying this morning by being the one who is being baptised? Is she proclaiming her goodness? Maybe even in some way that she's better than some other people. 
Is that what's happening here this morning? No. Because verse 6 reminds us where the glory, where the credit, where the praise for anyone being a Christian belongs. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Not to us, not to Charlotte, not to me, not to us, to him, to Jesus, to God be glory and dominion forever and ever. All the credit, all the praise for Charlotte or anyone having been set free from sin's penalty and power belongs not to Charlotte, not to anyone else, but only to God. To God the Father, to God the Son, Jesus, and to God the Holy Spirit. Freedom and life is not achieved by us. It's not achieved through good works. It's not achieved by coming to church. It's not achieved by being baptised. Charlotte is not being set free or forgiven or transformed or receiving eternal life or getting her ticket to heaven today. This water is just out of the tap, through a hose pipe. It cannot do any of that for her or anyone. Rather, freedom and life are from God. And they're a free gift from God. So not only are they not achieved by us, they're not deserved or earned by us either. They become ours because of what God has done through Jesus' death and resurrection. They don't become ours because of what we have done. We need to come to God with empty hands to receive what he gives. Not with full hands, full of all the things that we think we have to offer him as payments. And by being baptised, actually, Charlotte is positively highlighting and celebrating what Jesus has done for her. Because her going down under the water and coming back up again symbolises Jesus' dying, being buried and rising again back to life. So though sadly, you may have come across people who say they are Christians and think they are better than other people. A true understanding of Christianity will not lead to that. Because Christianity is not for good people. It's not for people who think they're good. It's for people who realise they're not. It's for people who realise there is nothing they can do, they can offer to God to earn anything from him, but that they need to wholly depend on what Jesus has done for them. And that therefore all the glory, all the credit, all the praise belongs to God, not to them. What is Christianity about? 
It's about love from God. It's about what God has done before it's about what we are to do. What is Christianity about? It's not about losing freedom. It's about gaining freedom in the greatest possible way. The freedom to to be what you were designed to be in relationship and in service of God. And what is Christianity about? It's not about our goodness. It's about glory to God. It's about praising God for what he has done for us because all the credit for anyone being a Christian belongs to him. And that's what John the writer of Revelation is saying to us when he writes to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to our God, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing again uh, now a a song that will hopefully allow us to reflect on something of what we've thought about there. Um, This is a hymn that's been chosen by Charlotte, but it fits in really well with what I've been saying as well. No greater love. Talking about the death of Jesus on the cross, reminding us that there's no greater love than his love. No greater demonstration of love than what he has done for us. So let's stand together as the music begins.
please have a seat. Okay, well, we come now to uh, Charlotte's baptism. Uh, and uh, I've touched on it a little bit uh, there in the, in the message, but let me just say very briefly uh, in plain and simple statements, why is Charlotte being baptized today? Let me just say four things that are the reasons why Charlotte's being baptized today. Number one reason is to obey Jesus. Charlotte's being baptized to obey Jesus' clear command to all who follow him to be baptized. Number two, Charlotte is being baptized to say to profess, to proclaim that Jesus is her saviour and king. Number three, Charlotte is being baptised to say that just as Jesus died and rose again, so she too has begun a new life. When she has put her faith in Jesus She has been joined to Jesus and therefore just as Jesus died, was buried and rose again back to new life, so Charlotte has begun a new life as well. And fourthly, Charlotte's being baptised to state her commitment, her dedication to follow Jesus from this day forward. To follow Jesus through all the days of her life. It's not just saying that she's doing it today. She's committing, she's saying that she wants and aims to do that through all the days of her life. Well, we're going to hear now from Charlotte herself, who's going to tell us uh, in her own words how and why She's arrived at this day today. I might need the water. <laughs> Four years ago, I was a very unlikely candidate for Christianity, let alone baptism for a room full of people. I didn't think I needed anything else in my life. I didn't question my worldview. I was married to the love of my life. We had three wonderful sons, fantastic family and friends. We were happy in our London home. Everything was going really well. It's a cliche to say you don't know what's around the corner, but me standing here today is only one thing I hadn't predicted back then. To say 2017 wasn't a great year for us is an understatement. In the first half of the year, Ian and I both lost our fathers. We grieved and life felt off kilter for a while. At no point did I think of turning to God. But in the autumn of 2017, something started happening. Two or three of my friends were Christians, and for some reason I began asking them about their faith and wondering whether there might be something in it. Assumptions I had held for a long time about Christianity were extinguished one by one slowly chipping away at my deep-rooted scepticism, yet I still had countless misgivings. I was pushing against God, but for the first time, he was pushing back. I was starting to see Christianity wasn't such a crazy idea after all. Then in November of 2017, that same year, a crisis struck our family. Our middle son became so ill that, to cut a very long story short, he ended up in hospital for four months. Two of those were spent in intensive care at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. We were no strangers to childhood illnesses. There had been ample opportunity for God to present himself and for us to engage, but it had never happened. This time was different. Our son was in a world-class specialist hospital, but we had no control over what was happening. And despite their medical knowledge, the doctors and nurses had their limitations too. We had to put our trust in them, but they were fallible human beings just like us. Looking back, it was the perfect time for me to become a fully paid-up member of the Atheist Society. After all, why would God, if he existed, let this happen? 
But subconsciously, I was becoming aware of an unseen power that was completely in control and which was sustaining us through the horror of the situation in which we found ourselves. There is a beautiful chapel in Great Ormond Street, and I soon became one of its most regular visitors. This was before I knew that you didn't have to actually be in a place of worship to pray. <laughs> That's how clueless I was at the time. I promised God that when Felix came home, I would start going to church and I would get to know him. When Felix was discharged from Great Ormond Street in late December, and the word miracle was bandied around by more than a handful of the staff, I knew I couldn't let God down. If I had pushed back against God before, and against Jesus, whose role I hadn't quite appreciated, he was now grabbing me by the throat. When you can't wait to read the Bible, and you look forward to church every Sunday, you know you've got it bad. I devoured every book about the faith that I could lay my hands on, and subjected the story of Jesus to serious analysis. In primary school, we had simply been told that Jesus died for us, which I remember thinking sounded rather unfair on him, if not completely baffling. I was beginning to scrutinise this story at the centre of Christianity. And the deeper I searched, the more I saw that my existing beliefs were being scrutinised as well. I started wondering why not believing in God should be the default. And the more I saw that my objections were pretty flimsy and incomplete, in contrast to the complexity and completeness of the Bible, the more I became convinced that what I thought was myth was actually truth. Despite this, I can't say I was entirely happy, always, with my newfound faith. It was annoying the way it had appeared and started demanding attention. Do I really need another thing on my plate, I thought. But to look at it another way, God has given me my plate. Sometimes it's full, sometimes it's not. Sometimes I have things I don't like on it, and other times it's my favourite meal. I can manage what's on my plate, but God can decide what he puts on it and takes off. I don't want to make him sound like some kind of divine dinner lady, but after all, he came to serve, and the least I can do is return the favour. It's funny, though, you don't always see at the time how God is working. It's only now I look back that I can see how he appears in the apparently mundane. There was one occasion in Great Ormond Street when this happened. I was given a flat to stay in across the road from, where, from the hospital where Felix was, and there was a washing machine there that I used to wash his blankets in the hospital. One evening in mid-December, I went to the washing machine and found I didn't have the right coins for it. So I went down the road to a cafe where I hoped they could give me some change. But when I got to the counter, they just shut up the, the cash register for the night, they locked up, and they said they couldn't help me. Luckily, there was a group of men finishing off their drinks, and I explained the situation and asked if they had change. One of the men said to me, what do you need? I can give it to you. He wouldn't take my money in exchange, but just said, I hope your son gets better. I went and washed the blankets and thought nothing more of it. About 10 days later, it was Christmas Eve, and Dean had driven to the hospital with presents for Felix, which I was getting out of the car. Suddenly, someone called out to me. It was the man who had given me the change, and he was walking past the hospital with his wife. How's your son doing, he asked. We've just been to church and prayed for him. Much better, I said. In fact, they're taking out his ventilator within the next hour. I thought it was interesting he had walked by at such an important stage in Felix's recovery, and I thought a lot about him in the months after. One day I was telling my friend Elizabeth Gilmore this story and I said, I'd love to thank this man. Straight after telling her this, I, she and I started a conversation about surnames. She said that she, she'd got a friend with a really nice surname that I liked and she liked. And then I said, my favourite surname I've always loved is Valentine. When I got home, I decided I'd try and look this man up because talking about him made me think about him again. And I thought, it's a long shot, you know, what can I do? I wasn't sure what I could do except look up the cafe online. Um, and hope that he was a regular customer and I could ask about him and who he was and then get in touch. So I googled the cafe and saw it had closed a year earlier. <laughs> but on its Twitter page, it suggested other places and people I might be interested in. And there was a photo of the very man I was looking for. I clicked on his photo and it took me to a social media page. There he was, John Valentine, rector of St. George's Church, Hol Hoban. <laughs> it wasn't lost on me that I asked for change and I got it in more ways than one. Looking back to that uncertain time four years ago, I see that the ground was being laid for me even before I needed him. It wasn't just comfort in a time of hardship. After all, I'd had plenty of other hard times when God could have been useful. I just believe he knew when I'd be most receptive. And now, whenever I wonder whether he's really there, I keep coming back to the fact that if I had to go through hard times again, I'd be on speed dial to God once more. So if that's the case, I have to trust him in good times as well as bad. 
Jesus has brought me a peace about the world and the future that I have never previously known. It's that so-called God-shaped hole that people have in their lives but don't realise. And I've been surprised at how many people have said to me recently that they wish they had a faith. Four years ago, I thought I already had everything. And now I have so much more. Ties as well. <laughs> Forgot, sorry. <laughs> That's great, Charlotte. Thanks um, so much for sharing that uh, story um, with us. Um, I'm going to ask Charlotte a couple of questions now um, that give her a further opportunity to uh, profess her faith in Jesus as Saviour and King. Uh, so, Charlotte, let me ask you. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for rescue from your sin and its consequences through his life, death and resurrection? I am. And Charlotte, with God's help, is it your desire and aim to follow Jesus as Lord through all the days of your life? It is. Amen. We're going to go down uh, into the water uh, in a moment uh, and baptise um, Charlotte. Let me just say um, what will happen after that. Um, first of all, if, if, if you want to um, uh, make some response to Charlotte being baptised, that's fine. Um, uh, I always feel like I want to do something after this happy uh, event. Um, so, so, so clapping is fine, um, as long as you mean by that not congratulations to Charlotte, as we heard in the message, but uh, an expression of joy, celebration of what God has done, uh, and uh, praise um, to him. That's entirely up to you, uh, but if you, if you want to, to do that, that's fine. Um, we'll then come out of the, the, the water, and I'll ask you then to, to stand, and we'll sing a final hymn. And then uh, Alan Gilmore, one of our elders here, will come and finish the service uh, in prayer. And then uh, please do stay for, for tea and coffee afterwards. Charlotte, based on your profession of faith, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. the music begins, um, please uh, stand to sing a, a, a song that reminds us uh, in the chorus that all we have is Christ. Jesus is our life. Stand as the music begins.
Please take your seats. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this service that we've been able to hold. We thank you, Lord, for the testimony that Charlotte has been able to give. But most of all, Lord, we just thank you for your love that has been displayed so very clearly in the giving of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As your word tells us, this truly is love. Not that we loved you, but that you loved us and that you gave your Son to be that very necessary atoning sacrifice for our sin. Thank you, Lord, that he has completed the thing that we could never do, that is, be that sacrifice that was acceptable to you. We thank you, Lord, that we see your love so clearly displayed and we, we res, rejoice, we just rejoice in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, that he has purchased our redemption through the shedding of his blood and that we have freedom in him, freedom to live our lives the way that you have designed them to be lived, in serving you and loving you, and that all we have is Christ. May we give you the honor and the glory in all that we do. We thank you for your grace. And so we just say that truly may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of a loving God who is our heavenly father and the very presence and fellowship of your Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. So do please feel free to stay for refreshments afterwards.